starting in the 50s with the, uh, the wave of public concern about smoking causing cancer, the tobacco companies developed a very sophisticated, probably the most sophisticated effort to confuse the public about science, to confuse scientists about science. And now we've seen the, 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 a lot of the same people, in fact, have gone over to becoming climate deniers using exactly the same kinds of strategies. I didn't think that we'd have a chance of getting, you know, anyone to go to the theater to go see a film about climate change because Al Gore has already made a film about climate change. If you look at the 10 hottest years ever measured, they've all occurred in the last 14 years. And the hottest of all was 2005. And the one thing we've learned is when you explain science to people, it hardens those who don't believe in the science. So it became a film about doubters and how people are able to stop us from believing in convenient science. In March 2015, director Robert Kenner will attempt what no one else has successfully done since An Inconvenient Truth, debut a successful documentary about climate change. The tobacco companies knew nicotine was an addictive drug, yet they told Congress, I believe nicotine is not addictive. You see the same small group of people that the tobacco industry used working on all kinds of other issues. Dioxins, pesticides, chemicals in general, I mean, there's no evidence that these are harming us. And tobacco is a great metaphor uh, because we know those are lies. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And the, you know, and when we start to see a lot of those people are the same people, and a lot of the arguments are the same arguments, it makes it a little easier to say, hey, maybe we're being lied to about other things, uh, including energy. The movie Merchants of Doubt is based on the book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. A key part of the strategy from the very beginning is to undermine the idea of scientific consensus. And one of the things they discovered in their own market research was that if you can persuade people that there's no scientific consensus, then people will think that it would be premature to act. So it's a very, very powerful strategy that we know works. And this is why you hear them saying as a kind of mantra, there's no consensus, the science is unsettled, you know, we have experts who don't agree, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty, there's considerable uncertainty, you know, you hear this phrase, considerable uncertainty, repeated over and over again. Science historian Naomi Oreskes authored a high-profile paper detailing the overwhelming scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. So the paper essentially just says that if you look at what scientific experts have to say on the subject of whether or not climate change is underway and whether it's mostly caused by human activities, the scientific community is clear the answer to that question is yes. And so the paper was simply just saying that. That's it. That was the whole thing. Nothing more. Yes, this is what scientists have to say. What was the response to the paper after it came out? Uh, well, that's when I started getting attacked. And that was when life sort of changed. It was a bit like, you know, going through the looking glass. And one of my colleagues at Scripps, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, said to me, you should talk to Ben Santer. Something sort of similar happened to him. Ben Santer, a senior atmospheric scientist at Livermore National Labs, was a key author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report in 1995. It was Santer who crafted the carefully worded key passage in the document, announcing for the first time that the balance of scientific evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. So my life changed. Um, lots of people didn't like that balance of evidence statement, and no personal animus, but I was, I was the carrier of that message. So you take down the message by taking down the messenger. Ben told me what had happened to him, um, and then the pieces began to come together because one of the people who had attacked Ben Santer was Fred Singer, and he was one of the people who was attacking me. The science around secondhand smoke hyped, the science around the ozone layer 
hyped going back 10, 15, 20 years? I'm happy to discuss all of these since I've been deeply involved in uh, these topics that you mentioned. Let me start with secondhand smoke. When I was in graduate school, I worked on stratospheric ozone depletion. And Fred would call me when I was in grad school and talk to me about how he didn't think humans were depleting ozone. And before that, he had real questions about whether humans were causing acid rain. He really criticized the work that connected secondhand smoke to, uh, to health impacts. And now he doesn't think global warming is an issue. So in 1995, you characterize secondhand smoke as a myth. We, you guys put out a press release on environmental myths uh, in 1995. Documents in the tobacco legacy library they got from, from all of the lawsuits over the tobacco companies, where a lot of this stuff has come out. And they say in there that they're extremely happy with your performance on this. This is from Brown and Williamson, and how they were arranging for media interviews for you, and you're doing uh, and so you did a big media, when you released this press release about Ms. you did this big media study. Uh, what are your views today on secondhand smoke? Do you think secondhand smoke is a carcinogen? How would I know? I'm no expert on, on cancer, and I don't know what's in secondhand smoke. I'm not a chemical toxicologist. Because I remember that day, um, I called Eric on the phone and I said, Eric, we need to write a book. Um, actually, I spoke to someone who was the Winston man uh, and he said when he was on the set he asked them uh, he asked the tobacco executives do you guys smoke and they said no that's for poor people that's for stupid people that's for black people we don't touch the stuff listen they did that was a difficult job to know they had a product that caused cancer and was addictive and to be able to keep selling it and to keep the question alive whether this is bad for you. That's not an easy job, but that is the playbook. And they develop a playbook saying doubt is our product. Just create doubt, keep going. Um, and at the same time, you know, this small group of people, when the tobacco money dried up, they went to new products. And today the big payday is energy. <laughs>